We'll give it a couple of minutes. If anyone got any questions, please ask. There's a couple down there. Oh, just uh, thanks, Miss. You yes, it's nice of you to say so. And uh, I don't know what time it is there in Sydney, Australia, but thanks for joining me. Um, it's either very early or very late there, so thanks again. So if anyone's got any questions, quickly, you can ask me and we're going to get going. Um, but thanks again, everyone, for joining me this morning and, and uh, keeping me company on these things. It would be very uh, lonely to sit here and talk to myself. Not that I don't do it in private, but I do. Uh, but it's nice to know there are people listening and joining in. And I hope you're enjoying the sessions and benefiting from them. Maybe, you know, maybe learning some things that you can use yourself in your own, in your own life. And in your, maybe if you're a hypnotherapist or therapist yourself in your own practice. Because although I'm a, I'm a hypnotherapist, if you like, a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the things that I do, the therapies I do, uh, have a crossover. And we can use them, <clears throat> we can use them in our everyday life. And because all we're really using is words and imagination. If you think about it, it's no more than that. I, I, strange enough, I do have a, a swinging watch, but I don't use it in general. I just take it out of me now and again just to frighten people when they say, are you a hypnotist? And I pull it out of my pocket and then people scatter. But I don't need those things. And you now understand if you've been joining me on these sessions that we don't need any kind of outside equipment other than our voice. And that's the joy of what I do, really. Um, anyone in the English speaking world, and I'm saying that, but the truth of the matter is now with technology and the brilliance of technology, we can help people all over the world. I've run courses in Brazil uh, with 150 students who couldn't speak English um, with simultaneous interpreters at the back of the room. Uh, everyone got it, everyone <coughs> <coughs> learned uh, from those trainings. So the, that's the joy of it for me. Providing I can speak and I can wheel me into a room, I can continue to work. And I'm hoping that you're also seeing that as you're watching these sessions, that there are things that you can think, okay, well, I can use that in my own life, maybe with my kids or with my own clients or with the people I love or my friends. Because as I was saying, as I've been saying throughout these sessions, and you'll, you'll see it in every, work, every bit of work that I do, my themes now have come down to something very simple, how we can influence, how we can help other people. If we can spike an emotion, and I would suggest it's a positive emotion, then there's a window of opportunity, maybe three or four seconds, where that person is open to a suggestion without any real um, resistance to it. And it's easy to do that. If I ask you, as I've done many times now over these last few days, to think about the people you love, think about the people that love you, then I've spiked an emotion. And in that moment, I can follow that up with a positive suggestion for what you want to achieve that day. So I'm hoping that you're getting that understanding. And whether you're um, an aromatherapist, whether you're doing um, EFT or whatever the therapy you're using, you can utilize this. I have a friend who does aromatherapy and she often has clients who are in pain. And while she's doing her massage and aromatherapy with the, the, these, her clients, she just runs the arrow. You know, they're in a wonderful, relaxed state anyway. And she just asks them to use their imagination, runs the arrow with them. And she gets incredible results from people who are suffering from chronic pain or useless, unnecessary pain. And I'm saying to you all that you can actually do that. Um, you can look back at these, these recordings of these uh, sessions Look for the arrow recording and the one the presentation I did for Health Flicks. It's all there on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's all free for you to go on and view and watch and learn from. And that's really what I want. I, you know, part of these, the idea of these sessions is that you're going to learn something from it. And as I was saying in a message I put out yesterday, even if you are a hypnotherapist and you're already using metaphor, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. If we just glean one thing when someone's teaching us something, just one small thing that can help our clients, then it's worth doing. So as I'm on the subject of it, this, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about metaphor, how I use it in my work, how you can use it in your work, and you can use it with your 
kids, if you've got kids, and or if you're working with kids. So metaphor, and if you like put it another way, storytelling goes back before the written word. You know, when the villages had the, the, the old guy sitting, I'm probably that old guy now, but the old guy sitting on the corner of the street, people gathered around and they told them stories. And within those stories, there was some kind of meaning in those stories. And people would get that and they would go away with that understanding without even knowing that that's happening. And so we can look at, if you look at fairy stories that we tell our kids, you know, Red Riding Hood, um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know, all of those wonderful fairy stories that we tell our kids when they're, when they're tiny. If you look at all of those, you can all, all, always see an underlying meaning. You know, we don't want to tell our kids that it's a scary world, don't speak to strangers, there are people out there who can do you damage. But we tell them about Red Riding Hood, you know, and about not stopping to speak to people on the way to our grandmas or whatever it might be. We don't want to say to our kids, you know, it's uh, when they're five or six, you know, it's, it's not good to break and enter into someone's house and wreck their few furniture and eat their food. But if we tell them about Goldilocks and the Three Bears, that the underlying message is that you just don't do these certain things. So we use metaphor, all of us will have done it when we're, when we're teaching our kids and um, reading to our kids when they are tiny. So we use it anyway. In, meta, in, in every first session of hypnotherapy, and it doesn't matter what the client's there for, whether it's heroin addiction, whether it's smoking, weight loss, fear, phobia, panic, I am going to use a metaphor. And for those of you who joined me yesterday, you would have heard one, whether you really took it in consciously or not, and that's the point of metaphor, is that you don't really understand it or, or uh, analyze it at a conscious level. The message from that, mes that metaphor should go in at an unconscious level. And that's the point of metaphor. You know, if I, if I tell you to do something, as human beings, we're resistant to people telling us what to do. And in hypnosis, we call that, a, you know, a direct suggestion or, or a, a direct command. From today, you will no longer smoke. If that would be a direct suggestion or, or a, a command. But if I was, had a smoker in my chair, and I know that they're already suffering from the health effects of smoking for years and years. If when they're in hypnosis, I just run this little thing that I run with some people. I say, you know, I had a friend once who, when he was a kid, he used to walk past this house. And he thought if he ever became uh, successful, he'd buy this house. And he became successful and he bought this house and he loved this house. And he decorated it in his favorite colors and he loved that house. But after a while, he started getting these headaches, started to feel sick. So his doctor suggested that he went on holiday for a while. So he went away for a couple of weeks and the headache disappeared and the sickness disappeared. And when he got back, he asked someone to check his house over. And he realized that there was a river running under that house and from some factory and it was poisoning the house and that poison had got into the house and it was killing him slowly. You know, it only took him one day to pack his things because he knew that his life, his family were worth more than any house, no matter how long he'd wanted it. So when someone's in hypnosis and, I, and I'm working with my general smoking things, I might run that little story by them. Because when, we, when someone tells us a story or tells us, a, a runs a metaphor past us or runs an analogy, when they're trying to express themselves in a certain way, <clears throat> and they use an analogy to do that, our brain does what's called a sub derivational search for meaning. We assume there must be some reason that this person's telling us this story. So our brain does that. It goes on a search for meaning and it will find something that's relevant to the problem they have at this point in time. So that is pretty much how metaphor works. Our brain is continually doing that. Yesterday, if you joined me yesterday, I ran what I call the story of the invisible barriers. For people who are psychologically stuck in some way, and they, we know that they, they can do something, but they're just, for whatever reason, not allowing themselves to do it. 
So that little metaphor that I ran yesterday, and I say, if you don't remember it, that's good, because you're not particularly meant to, um, but you would have heard it at an unconscious level. You know, and someone's in that stuck, stuck, stuck state, and it can be with your kids who don't believe they can do something, even though you know they're capable of doing something. And then you, I ran this little story yesterday, it's called The Invisible Barriers. And I say, I don't know if you know anything about farming or fencing, but especially those electric fences that farmers use to keep horses in. They run these wires around the field, and through that wire, they run a current of electricity, not enough to hurt anyone, but just enough to give you a startling zap. And they stretch these wires around the fields. And as those horses wander from place to place, they brush against the wire, they feel that sudden sharp jolt of pain, and being really smart and gentle animals, they pretty soon learn where they wanna go, where they don't wanna venture. And they learn so well after a while that the farmer can turn off the electricity and he can even replace that wire with string and those horses stay put, fenced in by nothing at all, by the thought that where they are is safe, providing they just stay put. An invisible barrier, an invisible boundary created by the mind. But you know, once one of those horses goes through that fence, all the other horses follow. But where to go next, that's the problem everyone faces, not everyone knows how to solve. No one knows how a horse knows where it's going, but we do know once it's seen the freedom at the bottom of the lane, it's really hard to rein it in. It's so much more fun just to hold on tight and see where that might lead you. You know, that's a pleasure any child can treasure. Even invisible barriers can be jumped over on the way to those goals. Now, when someone comes in and they're in hypnosis and I'm telling them that story and they're in hypnosis and they think, why is he talking about farming? Why is he talking about horses? Their unconscious mind will do that search for meaning. And even if it's not at a conscious level, they will get an understanding from it. Now, I might have run that, that story with maybe 20,000 different clients and they'll all have got something different from it because we're all, they're all there maybe for different reasons. So metaphor, when it comes to helping people understand things or overcome things, it's really important. And you all have a story. You know, some years back in maybe 2005, 2006, I created a, a, a training for parents and it was teaching them, teaching parents how to use some of these simple hypnotic phenomena to help their children. Because I personally believe that hypnosis, for want of a better way of describing it, is a heightened learning state. If you think what happens when you come to see me for hypnosis or you use hypnosis yourself, what happens is you, your mind opens up to suggestions, a different way of living, a different way of behaving, something you might not have understood before and you learn it in that hour or 30 minutes of hypnosis. So for me, it's a heightened state of learning. So it's no longer something to be afraid of, but it's something to be utilized, and especially with our children, because we can use it. You know, as an adult, we build up this defense against um, flattery and sales. You know, our, over, the, over the course of our, our life till we get to maybe 20, you know, the things that we learn, people that we can trust, people we can't trust. But as a child, we don't have that filter if you, that's why when we're children, we, can, we believe in Father Christmas. We believe in the tooth fairy. You know, the fairy stories uh, seem real to us because we don't have that filter against what's true and what's not true. But as adults, we build that filter to become stronger, if you like. It's called, I think they call it the critical faculty. That bit over our brain that protects us against lies, um, flattery and all those kind of things. But what happens when you're in hypnosis? If you like, you can imagine this tight net filter over your brain, which is filtering out the things that, that might harm you or hurt you. When you're in hypnosis, if you like, that becomes porous or perforated. So suggestions can go in, but the kids don't have that filter. They're already using their imagination and they're phenomenal at it. So if you, when we've spoken about this today, what I'd like you to do, if you've got children yourself, and I, the reason I'm, I'm running this session today, because it occurred to me yesterday, 
that we as adults, we understand to some extent what's going on around the world. And for even as adults, you know, um, worrying about how we're going to earn money in the future, worrying about whether we're going to get this virus, whether we're going to affect someone else, how we're going to live, all of those things at this point in time are causing stress and anxiety for quite literally billions of people. For the kids, even though they might not understand at that level that we understand, they will feel from us that there's something not right. And so the reason I'm, I'm doing this session today and talking about metaphor and how we can use it to help our kids is because we can, without saying, oh, this virus is this, and this is what's happening in our life, and this is, this is frightening, and this is dangerous, we can, and you can, put together a story. It doesn't have to be you know, a, a, an 80,000 word book. It can be an A4 piece of paper that with the outcome of that story being the outcome you want for your child. And if the outcome that you want is that they, they understand that they're gonna be safe or that it's gonna be okay, then that's a good enough story. As I was saying, back in 2000 and 2006, um, I, I started this training for parents. It was called Potent Shiru. Um, you can look on my YouTube channel, you put Poten Shiru in, it's the Japanese word for potential. But you put that in and you'll see the BBC covered this training that I was doing and the effects it was getting. And anyway, when I asked the, the parents, and there may be 40 parents on that first training course, to write a story, pretty much every one of them said, no, I can't do it. I'm not any good at storytelling. But when they went home and had that for their homework and they actually sat down and took the time out to write a story with something that related to their own child and the problem their child was having. When they brought those stories back and they read them out, and they were only like A4 sheets of paper, they weren't reams of story. There were all people in that room, women in that room that were crying. Now these people didn't think they could write a story, but they could. And you have a story within you. And you can if you want it. It doesn't have to be a fantasy. You can use an ancestor. You know, if you had someone, uh, you know, a grandfather or an uncle that was in the second world war who went through some kinds of trials and you've got a young young son and you tell them about that ancestor and how they went through those trials and how they came out the other end and they were safe and they were braver or whatever it is i'm, I'm not telling you what you should write but i'm saying to you we can use storytelling to help our kids we can we can use it to help our the people around us you know when I run my um, quit smoking sessions, I run this metaphor every single time. And, it, and it's true how it came to me. Back in the late 1990s, my son Anthony uh, gave me a book and it was called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And he said, Dad, you need to read this book. It's a cult classic. It's written by a guy called Robert Persig, and he wrote it back in the, in the 1970s. It's a bit of a hippie book, but he's, the story is him and his 12-year-old son riding across America on a motorcycle. But he uses the motorcycle and the maintenance of the motorcycle as an analogy, if you like, uh, or a parable for life itself. And when I'm talking to my smokers, and I ask three questions, and there are three beliefs and if you joined my smoking session the other day, you'll have heard this already. But there are three beliefs that we have to crack or we have to undermine when we're helping someone quit smoking. The first belief, that I can't quit. And they come in and, with that belief. And it's a solid belief for them because they've tried many times probably. You know, they're probably ill and they're still smoking. So they come in with a very strong belief, I can't quit. And the way I undermine that is I ask this simple question, if you went to your doctor yesterday and said, have another cigarette and your child would die, you would quit, would you not? Now, I've seen over 25,000 people for smoking and only once did anyone go, I don't think I would. Every single person, other than that one, probably one person, uh, and I won't say too much about that lady, but apart from that one person, everyone said, yes, if my child's life depended on it, I would quit. And I say, have you got any doubt? And they go, no. Now, in that moment, that first belief, I can't quit, has been smashed. They now know they can do it. So that one's gone. The second belief, 
but it's an addictive substance and they're, they're addicted to nicotine. We undermine by asking those simple questions. How long can you sleep for? And generally it's seven or eight hours. I say, you don't wake up every 35 minutes to have a cigarette. They go, no. So how long have you been smoking the same amount for? 20, 30 years. And the definition of an addiction to get any, continue to get something from an addictive substance, you have to increase the dose or shorten the time period. So that belief is cracked. So the second belief is gone. And the third belief that it's doing something for them. You know, I enjoy a cigarette. That's what most people say, albeit two or three cigarettes. And the third belief I crack with this metaphor, as I said, it's a true story. My son gave me this book and I say it to my clients. My son gave me this book is called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And what the man talks about, apart from what he's talking about is quality and what it means. But he also talks in the book about values and he talks about what he calls a value trap. Things that aren't any good for us, but we place a value on them and they hold us to it. And he likens one of these value traps to this monkey trap. Now these value traps can be anything. It can be you know, some, certain kinds of friendships, certain kinds of jobs, certain kinds of relationships, things that aren't any good, but we hang on to them anyway. Well, in the book, he relates this, these value traps to this monkey trap. It's known as the old South Indian monkey trap. And it's a simple but cruel trap. And what they do in this part of the world is they take a coconut and they cut a small hole in it and they hollow it out. Then they chain or tie the coconut shell to a stake in the ground. Then they put some rice in the coconut. And a monkey comes out the tree, I don't know if he sees the rice or smells the rice, but he knows it's in the coconut. And like us, he can squeeze his hand into a small hole. And the hole in the coconut shell is big enough for the monkey to get his hand into to get at the rice but it's not big enough for his fist to come back out of. So he reaches in, grabs a fist for the rice, now he's stuck. And he's held to the stake in the ground by nothing more than his own fist. But the monkey will be killed. He'll have his life taken away, his future taken away. He'll be separated from everything he loves and loves doing rather than let go of the rice. Because in his mind, there's a value in it. He enjoys rice and he's not gonna let it go. And it's only that value that's gonna get him killed, nothing else. Now, when I read that book, it was a long time ago, it occurred to me that's exactly the same for people who smoke, who are doing anything else that's detrimental to their health. I know it, you know it, you're walking from that habit today. The only thing that's ever held you to that habit is the belief and the value that you placed on it. You believed you were addicted and now you know it's just a habit. Before you came here today, you believed you enjoyed a cigarette, albeit two a day. But it's only ever been that belief and that value that's held you to that habit, nothing else. In the book, he says, if you can give the monkey one fact, one fact would set the monkey free. Imagine we could speak to the monkey, it could understand us. We might say, look, this fistful of rice, this minute amount of pleasure, it's not worth dying for, and it's not worth being separated from everything you love. And the fact is, the only fact the monkey needs to know, the fact is he can open his hand. If the monkey understood us and believes he's going, oh, you're right, he let go of the rice, pull his hand out the coconut and be back in the trees. Now there is one fact, if it were to occur to you, would allow you walk away from this habit forever. And then I get back into the fact that, remind them that they said, if their child's life depended upon it, their wife's life, their husband's life depended, they would quit. And then I suggest that their lives absolutely depend upon that happening today. So running that little analogy, that little uh, metaphor during that smoking session, without saying to them this, this, this and that, they're getting that message at an unconscious level. So <clears throat> today I'm going to run just a couple of little metaphors with you. You don't have, well, you will go into hypnosis because what is hypnosis other than taking a time out, closing your eyes, listening to my voice. I'm gonna run them just so you have an idea of what it feels like from the inside, how that, how that works. And then you're, you're gonna do this for yourself. And I'd like you to do it and understand that you're capable of doing this. 
In fact, when we do the little bit of hypnosis, I'm going to eliminate any of your fears or doubts about your storytelling ability. And who knows, one of you might even write the novel that's going to change people's lives forever. So, as I said, I hope you get the understanding here. This is just about communicating at a different level. If I'm not particularly a religious man, but I was brought up and I did go to Sunday school till I was 14 or 15. So I, I've, I've listened to a lot of the stories in the Bible. Now as a man, and especially as a hypnotherapist, you can look at those wonderful stories in the Bible at a different level, if you like. You can take them as fact, and that's what happened in reality. Or you can look at it as, look at them as, as wonderful metaphors for life. If you think about the Good Samaritan, you know, the, the underlying communication from that is that we can help. We shouldn't be any separation through race or creed or nationality. We should help our neighbours. We should help each other. So the beautiful uh, um, communication to get across. You can look at Daniel and the lion's den about overcoming fears. You can look at Samuel and, De and Delilah, the story that Samson and Delilah, and look at that story as a story about the power of love and, you know, and what love can do to us. So, you know, the prodigal son, I mean, I can go on and on, but there's some fantastic, beautiful stories in the Bible. And if we can look at them as this actually happened as fact, and that was true, or we can look on it as they were probably meant in the first place, as ways of communicating different ways of behavior, better ways of behavior, more positive ways of behavior. But we have these wonderful stories around us and you have them within you yourself. So I'm gonna ask you today to just think about it. Even if you haven't got children in your life, maybe think about using metaphor and creating your own metaphor in your own work or even with the people around you because it's a very powerful tool. You know, when we first learn hypnosis, when I first started learning hypnosis and I read about direct suggestion, indirect suggestion, embedded commands, all of those things which sound phenomenal, and, and they are. But indirect suggestion is purely storytelling and metaphor. When we tell, tell a story or we run a metaphor or we, we run an analogy of something, then What's happening there is that it's an indirect suggestion for change. I hope you're getting this and you can look at it again and we can talk about it again. And if you're interested in um, that course I ran back in 2006, 2008, the Pope and Cherie course, then let me know, email me and I'll send you the, 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 um, the manual that I had at the time. And if you're interested in, in doing that in your own work, if you want to go out and help parents help their children with some of these wonderful hypnotic techniques, um, then let me know and maybe we can do something together. But look, for now, I want you just, I'm gonna run the invisible barriers. So I want you to think before we start this, think of something that you want to achieve that you're either self-sabotaging yourself or you're just not getting around to doing. And then we're gonna run this thing and we'll just see what happens in your mind, okay? Look on this a little bit of time out for you. I'm gonna run a couple of things with you. And these, as I said, these stories I've run with thousands and thousands of people with you know, an array of different problems and they get something from it. So each of you out there are gonna be thinking something different, be something else, something you wanna change in your life maybe um, as I run this with you, okay? So what I want me to do is this, when you're ready, just sit comfortably. That's right. Place your hands separately. Make sure you're comfortable and you're, you're in a safe position. And as they say in storytelling, if you're sitting comfortably, then I'll begin. Okay, take a deep breath in. As you breathe out, just allow your eyes to close. Only as quickly as you're ready to let go of any unnecessary blocks or boundaries or limits in your life. That's right, once again, just 
allow that relaxation to go down through your body. You know how to do this now. If you've been in these sessions before, then just listen to my voice and let my voice take you into that space. Imagine you're just dropping down through space and time. Just for a while, nobody wants anything. No one expects anything. There is nothing for you to do but to relax and enjoy that experience. The deeper you go, the better you feel. Nothing bothers or affects you, nothing disturbs you. That's right, and as you drift in that wonderful space, the mind automatically moves toward those thoughts, ideas, images, that clarify most clearly for you the very things you know and do that seem to get in the way. Awareness migrates toward things that need attention in the same way that animals migrate, without thinking, without trying. They just seem to know when to go, where to go, and what to do to take care of themselves. An inner voice, an inner awareness, the moves, the birds, the animals from one place to another that makes them restless, something not right, that draws their attention toward that uncomfortable feeling and sets them in motion. And they move hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, taking care of their young, taking care of themselves. No one really knows how it feels to be a bird or a dolphin or a butterfly that suddenly knows the time is right for a change, that suddenly knows the exact change needed. But we can relax and imagine how it might feel to gradually, suddenly recognize that feeling that something needs to change and it needs to change now and to know without knowing what needs to be done, to be told without hearing by the inner voice, the inner feeling, do this now. And to have actions flow from those feelings, responding effortlessly, automatically, to that inner voice that tells us what to do and when and how to do it. To be born with that knowledge, to trust that feeling, to be so comfortably aware of yourself that everything becomes easier. Though no one ever imagined that traveling a thousand miles was easy, even though the decision to go seemed to take no effort at all. And so as you drift deeper, deeper, deeper down, I wonder if you know anything about farming or fencing especially those electric fences that some farmers use to keep horses in. They run these wires around the field and through that wire they run a current of electricity, not enough to hurt anyone, just enough to give you a startling zap. And they stretch these wires around the fields. And as those horses wander from place to place, they brush against the wire they feel that sudden sharp jolt of pain. And being really smart and gentle animals, they pretty soon learn where they can go, where they don't want to venture. And they learn so well, in fact, that after a while, the farmer can turn off the electricity. He can even replace that wire with string. And those horses stay put, fenced in by nothing at all, by the thought that where you are is safe providing you stay put. An invisible boundary, an invisible barrier created by the mind. But you know, once one of those horses goes through the, that fence, all the other horses follow. But where to go next, what to do next, is a problem all of us face at times, not everyone knows how to solve. And no one knows how a horse knows where it's going. But we do know, once it's seen the freedom at the bottom of the lane is so much more fun just to hold on tight and see where that might lead you. And that's the pleasure any child can treasure. Even invisible barriers can be jumped over on the way to those goals. 
Your conscious mind knows what you can do. Your unconscious mind knows it too. And now what's needed is for you to allow yourself to do it in the right way for you. To find those wonderful stories within you that you can tell to your children, your grandchildren, your friends. And you'll find yourself just finding that story without even thinking or trying exactly the right moment, the right time. And the person you're talking to, whether it's a child or a friend or a family member, will at an unconscious level understand the communication that you want for them. And you have that within you as every limitation drops away, as every invisible barrier now drops away from your mind, replaced by a new understanding of just what you can achieve, the powers you have within you, the strengths, the understanding, the love you have within you that you can take into everything you do. In a moment, I'm going to count to five. On four, your eyes will open. You know, a smile on your face, you'll feel incredible. And on five, that wonderful feeling and understanding will grow stronger throughout the day. So get ready. One, feeling absolutely wonderful. Two, to enjoy your day and make the most of it. Three, the feeling of freedom now from every limiting belief, every barrier that ever held you back. Four, eyes opening. Feel the force of that energy now. Five. That's right. Feeling absolutely wonderful. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's session and um, you got something from it. As I said, if you're interested in the, um, the training course, I haven't run for a long time. Uh, I've ran something with Kelly T. Woods last year called Keen, Kids Empowered Easily and uh, Naturally. Um, that training is going to be out some point in the future. But if you're interested in talking to me about how you can help kids in your, in your therapy room or help the kids in your life, um, or if you're interested in doing that training, um, then we can get it together again and maybe run it online if we're still in lockdown. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed today and enjoyed the other sessions. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be running a session on self-hypnosis, how you can take yourself into hypnosis, how you can utilize self-hypnosis um, for your physical goals, your emotional, spiritual goals, your financial goals. So I hope you can join me again tomorrow and uh, I hope you're enjoying it. And, and thanks again for joining me and stay safe. Do what they've been told. We might be down in lockdown for another three weeks or so. So let's make the most of this. Try and get ourselves fit physically. Try and get ourselves free mentally so that we can be the best we can be when we come out of this. So we can continue to help others and help ourselves, okay? So uh, I'm gonna say goodbye to, for now. I'll look at your chat, in the chat box and I'll answer any questions in there. Um, let me just quickly see if there's any questions that I can answer right now before we log off. Um, Right, someone's just asked me, uh, can you tell us again about how the negative words affect our mind, uh, body, subconscious? We talked about it a few days ago. Um, okay, right, so that's from Bridget. Okay, so if those of you who are still with me and interested in this, what Bridget's asking about is, is how um, we use negative language and how it affects us. So this is how I explain it. Your unconscious mind, your instinctive, intuitive mind. It's geared, in my mind, for two reasons. And this is just a Freddy theory. It wants you to be well, and it wants you to be happy. So it's working continuously for your survival and for your pleasure. That's it. Now, if, I suppose if you want to go back to the very beginning of our time, before we had the societies we have and everything else, it goes back to... Um, um, well, it goes back to continuing the race and our survival. So anyway, it's doing those two things for us. It will do everything to make that happen. The conscious part of our mind, this, what they call the frontal lobe, that's only developed in human beings over the last 150 to 200,000 years. So in that whole 85 million years of our evolution, it's only had that part of our brain for a very small period of time. But that's the part of our brain as the brocus area the part that understands language, can communicate in language and speech. Now, negatives, 
only exist in language. In the universe, things exist. Only in language do things not exist. It only makes sense for me to say there's not a, sit not a chicken sitting on the chair next to you. Of course, unless there is a chicken sitting on the chair next to you, in which case that would be strange in my mind. But anyway, it's only, it only makes sense for me to say there is not a chicken sitting on that chair. It only makes sense in language to say there's not something there. Now, the unconscious mind, as I said, it will get everything for you, but it was around before language existed. So it cannot process a negative. So if I say to you, don't think about the person you love, what happens? You immediately see that person's face. Now that works brilliantly in sales. If you know what the criteria for someone buying your product or your services, let's say you're selling a car and you know the criteria for that person buying that car is that it has to be economical. If you say to that person, this car's economical, they can believe you or believe you not. Because as I said earlier, we build up a, a defense against flattery in sales. But if you say to the person, look, don't think about the 50 miles to the gallon you're gonna get from this car, have a look at the quality of these seats. They have to think about the money you're gonna save. And it just goes in without any resistance. Now, as a, as a therapist, most of my clients will come to me and I'll say, how can I help you? And they'll say, I don't want to, I don't want to smoke anymore. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be unhappy. I don't want to be overweight. They'll tell me half a dozen things that they don't want to be anymore. And I obviously, I say to them, now tell me what you do want. And I explain this to them because this is what happens. I think I've got, still got to see a piece of paper out. Um, yeah, so this is what happens. When, I, when you say, I don't want to be afraid, or I don't want to be unhappy, I don't want to be sad, I don't want to smoke, that's actually the message your brain gets. I hope you can see that. So the don't, the negative, doesn't register. And the message your brain gets is that. Okay? So we do this to our kids as well. We say to our kids, don't be naughty, you know, don't play out in the street, don't be unkind. And we look out the window, there they are in the street, and you think they're defiant little sod. What we should say is, stay in the garden, be kind, be gentle, be good, as opposed to don't be naughty, don't be unkind, don't do this, don't do that. Because we think they're just being defiant, but the don't part of that message just goes straight over their head. It doesn't register. And it's not just for our kids, but for ourselves. And you are going to, if you didn't do this the other day, you are going to do it now. You're going to start to hear yourself saying, oh, I don't want to be ill. You know, I don't want to be unhappy. I don't want to, I don't want this. I don't want that. You know, I look in the mirror. I don't want to put any more weight. That's one of the classics. You know, I don't want to smoke anymore. What you must say is what you want. You know, I want to be 10 stone. I suppose I don't want to put on weight. You know, I want to be well, as opposed to I don't want to be ill. And tomorrow when we talk about self-hypnosis, this is one of the most critical points when we're doing self-hypnosis, our self-talk. And this is one of the most important things, that we state uh, the outcome in the positive. So I hope that's answered your question, Bridget. Um, just state what you want and say, I want to be happy and see what happens. Say, I want to be well and see what happens. Because your unconscious mind, from the moment you draw breath to the moment you die, is continually working for you. And it only is ever working to the best outcome. It wants that for you. And given the opportunity and the right direction, it will make that happen for you. Let me just say quickly, when we're doing our self-talk and we're giving ourselves suggestions, Think about your unconscious mind like a seven-year-old girl. If you were to ask a seven-year-old girl, because I don't know, I've got granddaughters and you might have daughters yourself. You might have been a seven-year-old girl yourself. Um, but you know what a seven-year-old girl's like. They want to do things for you. They want to keep doing stuff. Can I do this? Can I do that? Now, if you said to a seven-year-old girl, look, here's 20 pounds, go to the corner shop, get some shopping. then you have no idea what's going to happen, you know, because what, what she's going to bring back, because she's a seven-year-old girl. You, 
need to be very direct if you're asking a seven-year-old child to do something for you. And it's the same with your unconscious mind. If you ask that girl, you'd say, look, here's 20 pounds. Go straight to the corner shop, go in, buy two pounds of potatoes, a can of peas, blah, 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 and then take the 20 pounds, give it to the lady behind the counter, wait for your change, put the change in your pocket, and come directly straight back. It'd have to be very, very clear directions for your child to do something like that. And it's the same for your unconscious mind. It needs a clear direction, and it has to be stated in the positive. You know, it mustn't be woolly goals. You know, I want to lose some weight at some point. That's like asking that kid to go to the corner shop with 20 quid and get some shopping. You know, it has to be direct. I want to lose this much weight, or I want to be this weight at that time. And then you're going to get a result. It's the same for everything we do. So anyway, Bridget, I've, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, as I normally do. Uh, and as I said, to, uh, I say to people when I start talking about hypnosis to me, you can get me started. That's easy. Getting stopping me is another thing altogether. So anyway, I hope you understand that uh, power of a negative command, and use it for yourself. Use it in a way that works for you. Okay. So anyway, all of you out there, I hope you've enjoyed today's session. Remember, write those stories. Take the time out today. We've got a bit of time if you're in lockdown to take the time out to write that story. There may be a story you've always said I'm going to write at some point. Maybe now's the time to do it. But utilize storytelling, metaphor in your work, and use it for the people around you. Okay. Say goodbye for now and uh, have a beautiful day. Stay well. Keep your distance and uh, let's get through this together. Okay. Have a wonderful day. Take care.